Hey guys, my name is David. For the last roughly year or so, I've been a member of the PowerTech podcast and I've trusted Eric and Andy to help me as a hockey dad, raising my kids and trying to figure out the answers. I don't have all the answers and it's a great source of information and it's a, an area where I feel comfortable leaning on to help me make better decisions. With that said, one thing I do know about is supplements. I find it's hard to navigate the whole supplement world and make sure that you're using products that work, that are effective, and again, are science research based. Blue Star products, incredible brand. The products are based on research, science, the products work, trademark patent ingredients, and you can find all of the research just by scanning QR codes that are right on the back of the product. Thank you to Eric and Andy for their podcast. I think it's amazing and definitely give Blue Star products a try. This is my one of my favorite parts of the week. Yeah, I know. As I soon like as it. I finish the clap, yeah. it's like now we're rolling. It's good. I like it. It's good. Um, uh, do you have anything to say to start? Yeah, I a couple things. Okay, fire yeah, it up. Like so, I, I a couple weeks ago in Guelph, Christine and I went to the bookstore, and I've been reading like some good books and stuff. But like I, we always talk about how um, there's only in business books grit. All these books, it's like the same, like you could probably, as I said to Christine the other day, I said, I, I got to find something to change my, to, to, to learn some stuff, but whatever. I just don't like, I, now these books can be written in about three pages and it's like, yeah, new idea there. Okay, great. All the, a lot of it is filler. So anyways, I was browsing through some books. I was going to get a coaching book um, or a biography. And then I came across one called uh, How to Survive History. It's pretty title. cool. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll lend it to you, actually. I don't like to do this. It's not that important to me. So it was like the first one is like, if you were uh, lived in the time of dinosaurs, how would you survive? Oh, cool. So it's different. not really like, so it's not really like how you, act. It, it could be how you survive, but not really. It's, it was more or less a way of getting people interested in how that part of the history of the world worked. So it puts you in a place like, okay, if you lived in whatever time, you know, it'd be hot. It'd be this, that. The biggest animal was a ty ty Tyrannosaurus rex or the biggest predator that you would have and how you can outrun them because you have more agility, but blah, 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 blah. And it was all that. So, but then, but you just learn about that history of time and like makes you go like, wow, like, wow. And then it takes you to like all different places, the dark ages, ice ages, well, how it happened and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah, pretty cool. So, like, I'm actually reading the whole book because there's some some new information for me. That's nice. Yeah, it's nice you got a perspective shifter. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. I think the you know what I heard. I don't know how true this is, but uh, they're starting to find evidence that from things like the pyramids. Like, you know, they have no idea how they built the pyramids. Like, nobody yeah, it knows. talks about it in this book. Yeah, nobody, no one knows. And so, like, I guess there's I forget the guy's name that had found some that's like putting this theory forward, but he's thinks that. Um, they think like like civilized humans are like twelve thousand years old or something like that. And this guy's like, no, no, we were like way before that, based on. Got a sneeze. Huh? Had a sneeze, didn't come. Uh, based on some of things like this, uh, there's more evidence than that. I'm I'm really doing a shit job explaining it, but um, things like the pyramids and stuff, and they really don't know how old this stuff is. They're starting to think it's a lot older than we originally thought. And it's cool to put yourself in those perspectives, whether it's dinosaur time, as an example, or just how different, just how different the world is, man. So, you know, so, so I was in, I was in British Columbia recently and I'm looking at like just the nature mm -hmm. and just how things. So I was there five years ago, four years ago. Yeah. Like I'm just looking at how things are, have developed and how things are structured just naturally, just naturally occurring. So on the one hand we're it's so mysterious. That's what's interesting about it. I think that's why it's so um captivating it's oh. captivating so we're doing the, we're doing hikes through the mountains whatever and that's great and all you're thinking the whole time is like wow this is beautiful like this is unbelievable whatever we finished one of our hikes when it was dark now and it goes scary. it goes to scary yeah. real quick because you don't know what the heck's going on in there you don't know i don't know how it survived in there so it's it's amazing how like if you take a minute to pay attention to the world around you, it's pretty crazy to think like, how long has this been here? Like what is yeah. going on? Right. Yeah. So in that book actually talks about uh, the place, there's the big crater. I, I can't pronounce right now in Mexico. 
that big crater, the big crater that almost ended civilization, wiped out the dinosaurs and stuff. That the mountains that you just saw are a result of that. Right. Yes. So that damage that it did to the to the earth that almost ended our planet. Legit. That was the one. They think that was the one that uh, killed the dinosaurs. Oh yeah, hundred percent. That was the one that started it. Yeah. And I think it's that that goes into the reason there was the ice age is because the temperature dropped, but it was all about carbon. And there yeah. was such a film from that that, light that it froze. Can, sunlight couldn't get yeah, through. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, really neat. It's a pretty cool book, man. Chicalu Pueblo. That's it. That's it? Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. Which I don't know if I'm saying that right. but It's a huge crater. Yeah, huge crater. Interesting. That'd be cool to see too. Oh, man. You ever been to, uh, just as we keep shooting the shit here, have you ever been to um, Grand Canyon? No, no, me neither. No. That's one I would like to see. Yeah, it'd be cool. I guess I was talking to my Christine about it. She was saying that you you need to have a guide because it's so big that you could go all day and get nowhere. So For it's sure. like you need it's like way too big. Which I've never been. I have no idea the vastness of it. But yeah. said a lot of people do like well, helicopter tour tours over top so that they can cover the whole thing. But. So you played hockey near Elora. Elmira, Elora. El, yeah. So Both Elora right is a place for people that aren't from southwestern Ontario or whatever that have never heard of it. It's a gorge. Yeah, in, beautiful. Yeah, it's up near Guelph, so out where you play Junior B. And uh, I've been there a couple of times to go for a walk, and it's unbelievable. But so you just take a look at that gorge, like how deep and how, like, wow, where, you know, someone. So, like, this is what I always do when I go to Niagara Falls or places like that. It's like, why is there population here? Obviously, water is a, a big thing, key element. But can you imagine being the first dude that was – walking through and heard the, the falls or whatever and then you say okay i'm gonna start living here right like that gorge is unbelievable so anyways if anyone's going through laura which is near elmira which is north north near north of guelph south of owen sound what a and it's a nice little town with little pubs and stuff like that it's a really nice place to spend a day if you're a family guy <laughs> Right, but like, there's so many places. So if you take that gorge, which is absolutely mind blowing, and put that on steroids, you got the Grand Canyon that you're talking about. Like, it's amazing what what's out there, really. Right? There's little nooks and crannies all over the place that are really nice. Not to be a, a freaking uh, historian or a yeah, geographist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is great though. It's nice well, to get it is get pretty cool into that. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a big uh, big nature boy. Love that kind of. Because I'm from I'm from Sudbury, Ontario. And like when people uh, talk about Sudbury, it's like when I when I was a kid, it was like very dark and black, and a lot of people said it looked like the moon, and they did some greenery thing. But what it is, it's a basin. It's like a bathtub. The city is like in a bathtub, not an actual bathtub, but like it's from a meteor, and that's why there's all the mining and all that stuff is from there, right? So it's like so rich with uh, minerals and stuff like that. That's why it's like endless mining. But it's like literally a uh, literally it's a a, a a meteor that landed and made it like a bathtub and the city is in within that so everything everything is built on rock so when you like i would talk to a lot of people in um you know like what's sudbury like or whatever you see houses being built and i'll talk about in sudbury like to build a house most houses you're not just digging a hole with a backhoe you're blasting out rock so you got subdivisions there's one called moon moon rock i think it's a moon moon yeah moon rock moon rock moon glow development it's an area in Sudbury by the lake. And I remember, because uh, I was actually building houses with a guy at one time. And uh, imagine me with a hammer. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I was his helper. I was young. Yeah. And uh, you, you, people, the, the, the construction companies have to use dynamite to blow, yeah, out, blow the, out the base. Yeah. Like, come on, man. That's crazy, man. What a foundation, though. Well, man, this, this is what's cool about I'm starting to get a little bit of the travel bug. Like, I like going around different places. Not for long periods of time, because that gets a bit much for my life. But... I'd like, I'm starting to be more and more interested in just like going somewhere and being like, holy crap. It just really helps you to zoom out of your little world. Like we're always sitting here talking about hockey stuff. It's like you get out somewhere like that or you read a book like you're talking about and it just zooms you out a little bit and makes you think of something outside of your little circle of life for a minute because there's so much more going on and there's so many things that are so interesting to learn about. So it's cool. That's why I love reading books too. I got one, uh, I'm reading a Peter Thiel one called Outlive. And it's cool because he's, he's a, if anyone hasn't heard of him, he's a doctor. Actually, just a little fun fact for how I pick how to read books. I've talked about this before, but normally it's off a recommendation or somebody that I listen to in a podcast or whatever. But when I go to buy the book and I like buying the book in print 
I don't like the Kindle or like the audio book. I like reading the words, but I'll go to whatever bookstore and I'll open to like a random page in the book and I'll just read whatever page I land on and just see like, did it, did it suck me in a little bit or is it interesting? It, it means nothing. It's just like a little test that I like to do. So if I'm comparing, like I'm going to buy one of three books, I'll do that. And whichever one I like better for the one page is how I buy it. So anyways, I went through that with this Outlive book and he talks about uh, the premise of it is kind of like changing modern medicine to be more pre- preventative than um, kind of after the fact trying to address problems. So he finishes off. I haven't got to the part yet, but I kind of know where he's going with it. He's talking about what you would need to do to compete in the centenarian Olympics. So if you're like 100 years old and you're, there was a Olympics for the 100 year olds, like what would the events be? How would you have to train to be able to do those things? And it's stuff like, like carry 15 pounds of groceries up three flights of stairs. It's like, that's the kind of event he's talking about. So it's super interesting, kind of along the same lines of like thinking about things in a different way and, and getting new information out of, out of a book or whatever. It's a cool thing to read about because now for me that I'm out of like competitive sports, it's like, what's the training goal? You know, cause you're always trying to have some kind of goal or purpose to what you're doing. And that's a good way to frame it now where it's like, okay, I don't have a performance goal I'm trying to meet in terms of a competitive sport, but I have one that I'm trying to meet in terms of just life in general so that I'm not decrepit when I'm in my seventies or whatever. So it's really cool. But that, that's why I like, like reading books like that. But that one you're talking about sounds interesting. Yeah. It's, it's, it's cool. cool. It's different. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it's uh, held my attention. I'm putting more time into this book than I have in the last probably 10 books that I've read. Yeah. Not really, but for, for the most part. Yeah. And then last thing I just wanted to say was like, I'm, and I have a reason for saying this, it's really nice to see a couple things. Really nice to see players that were not like, so I'm going NHL first. Uh, nice to see players that were not drafted, get some looks at uh, development, ca- not development camps, uh, rookie camps and uh, NHL camps. Um, and then, a side note to that is it's nice to see like uh, as they're winding up the preseason in the OHL, really nice to see kids earning spots. It's, it's, it's really nice to see because, you know, we talk about this and, you know, a lot of people can say, yeah, but yeah, but, or whatever. But, um, you know, I know I'm not going to say names, but on uh, Guelph, there's a kid that made it, um, made the team, just made the team. And there's a couple they were looking at that had some, you know, they gave some good looks. And you can always sit there. You go if you're not drafted real high, you know, how are you going to get there? Because it's the teams, the, the teams are all pretty much picked. And I'm looking at the spits and like different teams. How there's a lot of kids that were either late round picks from a year or two ago, and um, or not drafted that they just came in and impressed. And I, I love seeing that because, you know, when when we're going through the hockey thing there's a lot of love that goes to the the best players are the ones that stand out the most. But, you know, I think a lot of the times the forgotten path, and it's a harder path is to earn that spot. And it's not easy. We talked about a training camps not too long ago. It's not easy to go into the unknown and just be you and play your game and out, be outstanding. Yeah. Cause it takes a little bit of guts, right? It's hard to figure out too. Yeah, yeah. But it takes guts because you've got, you know, let's essentially, it's a word. Huh? Yeah, great word. Yeah. Essentially 15 to 18 guys that are on the team. And you're going in there to basically try to push them around. I don't mean necessarily physically, although that could be that, but it's like outplaying these guys that are comfortable. Mm. And to do that, you have to get yourself uncomfortable because you're not making friends by, you know, if you're you're the star of the team and I hit you hard or I take pucks from you and I'm hard on you. Yeah. You're going to ruffle some not, feathers. <laughs> yeah. That's, it's, it, it takes a certain breed, but it's like the, the kids that really want to be there show up and it's nice to see i I really really like seeing the underdogs come through and not that because they're underdogs like in the sense that because they're last uh, a later pick or not drafted that they don't that much of an underdog but it's what i mean by that is just like the theory of the draft and all these things you're not supposed to make it i just like to see that determination in those kids that that do because it's special, man. And they don't take it for granted and they earn it. I love seeing kids earn it. Well, you know, because you get a lot of times the guy's an early pick and they get the benefit of the doubt for a longer period of time. And that's just the way it is. But but the side note to that is, you know, I was talking to someone today talking about a player, players, you know, kind of early on in the season bitching about ice time or questioning ice time. And, and it's like, you know, the hardest thing, I think, for a lot of players, um, is to be who you are. 
<laughs> excuse me. And and what I mean by that is you can get caught up in um you can get caught up in the points and ice, like even ice time. But the bottom line is is that if you're going to get like say for example you go to an OHL team, it's not so much the points that that are going to make you a player. And we talk about this all the time. But it's what do you bring? What do you bring? What what do they notice? So, you know, a lot of times people get drafted and people go, I don't know how he got drafted. This guy was better, this guy is better, but it's like maybe that guy did the work for those two. That it was the unsung hero, and that's more translatable at the next level than what those guys bring. Or maybe they all bring something, but that that guy's value because of the work that he does earns him a spot. So I would encourage players and parents and coaches like always find that thing that you're really good at. So like, if you're just really, really, really tenacious, like super tenacious and you don't get one point, that doesn't make you a bad hockey player because at the next level, that could be all that a team needs. And that might translate to the next level. If you're the most tenacious for checking, back checking, defensive, hardworking kid out there, that could be the thing that gets you to the next level. Whereas the guy that got 30 goals has to get 30 goals to be relevant. You know, and if you're just that real quiet, defensive player that, you know, defenseman, let's say, and you're not really noticed, like it's not like people aren't raving about you, that might be your thing. So I just want to encourage people like not to, and so then it comes down to ice time. Like the next part of that is, when you when you complain about ice time or want everybody wants more i get that but when you're when you're looking at ice time it's like you a real refreshing thing is when a kid doesn't care i should that's the wrong term but worries less about ice time but more about what he can contribute to the team that also doesn't go unnoticed so you know what i mean so if you if you see a kid that's like a third line guy that possibly could be on a second line, but he's not happy to be there, but happy to contribute to the team the best that he can to make the team better, it's like make the team better, then it's really refreshing to see those kids. And, you know, I know one that's at an NHL camp right now that got there simply because kind of the things that we just talked about. He's relentless. He's tough. Didn't get drafted. Does things for the team that other people aren't willing to do or you don't get maybe as recognized for or the press clippings, but he's at an NHL camp right now and good for him and totally 100% deserved. It's just really nice to see it. Yeah. And I think that's uh, part of the thing that's hard about it is it's hard to, it's hard to know that information. Like it's hard to, cause I remember playing, it's always about more ice time, more points, want to be on the power play. That's what everyone wants all the time. And I think if as coaches, as organizations, as parents, whatever, if you can do a better job helping kids understand like that question, like what do you contribute? Because like you said, I played with guys that were 30, 40 goal scorers, but there's no way with how they play, they could do it at the next level, which is why they didn't go on to the next level because they could score their 40 when the competition is at this level. But when we crank it up three notches and it's at this level, now that goal scoring ability isn't there anymore. Whereas if you're somebody who's really tenacious, to use your example, that could always translate at every level. Maybe. Right? Maybe. So, maybe. Maybe you might be really tenacious and not very good or smart, which negates everything. But it's, it's but my point is that there's that one thing. There's that one thing that you just can't overlook. could be you're, you're an incredible passer. You just make beautiful plays. You know, and you don't do a whole lot else. But there's one thing. It's like maybe. You know what I mean? Yeah, knowing. It's, knowing it's almost like. Sorry to cut you yeah. off, but it's almost like some guys, here's another another thing, right? Sometimes sometimes you look at a guy, how, okay, this guy got drafted in the third round. I thought he'd go higher. Or this guy got drafted in the fourth round. I thought, oh man, I thought he'd get hot, go higher. Sometimes you do, you're just a really good hockey player all around, right? You're just a really good hockey player, but you don't have the one thing. It's like at the next level, what are you? So yeah. I played with a kid that was like that on my, my team. He was probably our best player at the time and it was he was exactly that he was really good at everything but there was nothing that he was exceptional at or nothing that it was like this guy does this 
really well. You couldn't put a finger on anything in particular. So he was pretty dominant at like the AAA level. And then he was just solid at the junior level, but he, it went down. It didn't go up. Right. So he was dominant. He went from dominant to just solid. And then he went from solid to unable to make the next jump, you know, and that was kind of, kind of the thing. So it's really important that you know yourself as a player. So it's good. It's nice if you can get some guidance on that because as a kid, it's really hard to, to figure that out and to know what the one thing is even, right? Because you, you don't really have the brain yet to be able to grasp some of these concepts. Or maybe it's just because no one's ever taught them to you. But um, if you can find somebody that, that can help you to get that kind of stuff, then it, you'll, be, you'll have a big leg up, especially when you're young. Because most kids are just like all about ice time, all about points and all that kind of stuff, you know? So um, I'm going to go into our topic now. Unless you have anything else that you want to talk about. No, you're good. Cool. So, so we had a, we had a clip the other day that struck a chord, which was nice. Um, and not in a negative sense either, actually. We, I, I made a clip talking about, um, a guy that you saw at one of the camps that was doing video. And for, for people that are listening to the full episode, you know, the whole context of the clip. So like, we don't have to get into like the negative side of it of people not really get what we were saying because we had a little bit of like, well, you could use video for this, this, and this, which is good. It's like, yeah, we, you think we don't know like the benefits of using video. It's like, obviously we know the benefits of that, but I thought it was a good point of a good topic because clearly there's a little bit of interest in it and it might be nice to talk about, um, how to use video properly, how to not use it properly. And that analysis part of the game, particularly for like coaches, parents, and even players, if you're not that sure, that's kind of why I thought it might be interesting to go through because a lot of times th- this is very common. Like you think you're helping or you might be giving bad advice, or you think you're doing what is necessary, but you might be doing it the wrong way or, or whatever. So the problem is, is the, the good intentions thing, right? You're, you're intending to do something good, but maybe you're giving the wrong advice or, or whatever, right? So I thought it might be nice to, to run through that a little bit. Um, and that, that clip that we posted kind of inspired me to do that. But, but before, uh, before we do that, I want to talk about the, the memberships again, real quick, just for like two minutes, because I think we, we're getting to a point now with like a lot of people that listen that we can start to do some we could potentially start to do some pretty cool things um, with the podcast in terms of like going out and seeing people and doing stuff. And I think what a lot, a lot of what enables that is the fact that people are members because that lets us invest more time. So I had, I had a few people reach out with like suggestions of things that we can do. And I always am finding myself in the position of like, I would love to do that, but there's this thing that takes time or there's this thing that costs too much money to do, or there's this, that. so the more that people, uh, like support us with the memberships, the more we can do that kind of stuff. Like we've had people reach out about coaching clinics. We've had people reach out about doing camps and all these kinds of things that we would love to do. So if you're in a position where um, you can support us, I'm starting to realize, and I think you are too, that this could actually be like a a really nice transition um, with our business where we can come and see you guys and reach out and do more things that are actually helpful as opposed to you just listening to us yap about things. We could actually get some in-person uh, time. So if you are in a position where you can afford to do that, it's only 10 bucks a month. And then you guys can, um, do consultations with us. We have our videos online, whatever, but more than anything, it's just going to help us to expand and start to do some of these things that we're starting to see as being possible. Um, but the only way that's going to happen is if people actually support it and make it something that is, um, we can afford to do basically. So, uh, if you're in a position where you can do that, then, um, that's something that you'll be able to, to do with us. Uh, as we continue to grow and make this like actually more of a platform than, than just like you guys listen to us yap about stuff. Um, so we're going to continue to make it better and grow as we keep, as it keeps getting bigger. But I think that's good. And one of those elements is actually video stuff because people often reach out about like, they want to set up something where um, like I have one in the queue about um, doing like a, an analysis or what was the term, like an evaluation where you can go over video with the kid. And, and that's one element of it. So Unless you have anything else on that. Well, just, just on that is okay. like, I, I, again, a lot of people, we don't talk about a lot of things we do. And I'm always kind of bashful about who I train and how I train and stuff like that. Or in, in yourself, like what the business does. But like, yeah, like I've done some very really, like I've been across the country doing a couple of leadership events for uh, for athletes. That's something that maybe that's, I mean, it's actually really worth it. There's leadership, there's coaching, the coaching, uh, taking coaches and running those Clinics for coaches, something that is very uh, appealing to me. Um, you know, camps and clinics is another thing, but like the education side on that kind of stuff is something that we're very, very interested in. And, you know, reach out. It might not be available right away, but it's if you send ideas like that, we can definitely 
tell you, like, we're not going to lie to you and say, oh, yeah, we can do that if we can't or do something just because. But we're, uh, the, what you see here is what you get in real life. Um, and, you know, nothing but benefit from, for, for any player that we've ever trained. It's like they, there's nothing but good, positive stuff and uh that are going to benefit them so anyways that's that's what i ought to add to yeah that. and the, the, like you people that listen you're the ones that can enable that like we don't we actually don't really have the choice it's more up to people that listen like if you're in a position where you can do that that's what's going to allow us to do that so if it's of interest to you it's more than of interest to us we would love to do it so it's up it's up to people that listen to to be like on board with it and, and want to support it so membership links are online if you guys want to do that then that's extremely helpful as we continue to like turn this into whatever it's going to turn into so um, with that, any opening thoughts about just kind of like the video thing in general, whether it's off that clip or yeah, so, off of whatever. So off of that clip, it was, uh, you know, it was funny because even when I said it, when we were talking about it in the podcast, I'm like, this, this is probably going to go sideways a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And that's how I, I, I saw the first few comments was, but it wasn't the whole obvious sentence. I was explaining at a, at a camp where you're getting OHL evaluated. camp, <laughs> OHL camp. <laughs> yeah. uh, a parent yeah. had a tripod and a parent had was yelling at his kid and stuff like that. So, but that part was left out. It was like tripod guy was there and he mm -hmm. yelled at his kid. And a lot of the things were, why do you judge? Yeah, and, like, and what's wrong like, with well, I, I sent it for my, to, cause my, my, my parents are out of town. They want to see the games and all that kind of stuff. But it's like, there's nothing wrong with video. Like <laughs> you're an idiot. If you don't think you use video, and they're like, I, and I'm, I, as soon as I'm reading them, I'm going, well, yeah, I know. Like, but <laughs> if you just listen to the whole podcast yeah, and you would just, you wouldn't have a comment except yeah. for like, yeah, that's kind of weird. Yeah. So the point of that clip was there is a time and a place. And trust me, if you want to be the guy that brings a, a, a camera and yell at your kid at a OHL and NHL college camp, then you go for it. Like, that's fine. I'm just saying like our job here or what we are trying to do all the time is to educate the parents and the players and the coaches. So in that situation, the education would be don't do that if you want to have a good impression. If you don't care or if you want to be abrasive with the brass of that team, then do that. But it's, it's and, and there's, a, there's a time and a place. Like at a certain level, bring in your tripod. Uh, I, I told this to one of my friends once because he used to put the, 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 the GoPros. GoPro on the glass yeah. and stuff like that. And, and I, hey, I get it. I get it. Like... Um, you want to see your kid or you, maybe your kid wants to watch it himself. And I guess like, there's no judgment on that. It's just, but like typically most of the time when it's the people going from one end to the other, the ones that I knew were a little bit, they were going to go over the video with their kids or they were going to set up a website, like whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, but when, when, what, when would I like, I, it's not even for me to say what's good and what's bad about it, but like, of course everybody wants to see their kid play. And if you have it on video, a lot of people think that, when he's older, it's going to be something to look at. And and for some people, maybe maybe some people sit around when they're 35 and just reminisce and lock themselves in the basement and watch 60 hockey games that they played when they were in Pee Wee. Maybe that happens. But like from my experience, most people don't do that. But that's okay to have. I mean, I, I would love to. Like I would, I would do a lot to be able to go and watch when I was at my best in youth hockey or at a term. I would, it would be cool to see. It would be cool, like, it would, but we can't do much about it now. Like for five minutes, it's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like five how, minutes how to check it out. You just, yeah, <laughs> yeah, then you go, okay. I thought it was better, or yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever. Yeah, but yeah. you know, but it would be cool. But and then, of course, I understand um, people sharing it or having it available for their kids or watching it. Like, I get all that stuff and sending it to grandma and grandpa or whatever. But what I what I find is is that like most of the people that do it are they end up not most of the people. It seems like a lot of the people that do it um are very concerned parents like they, like you know that term i use is motivated parents and there's motivated players and they usually don't live in the same house and i usually find that the motivated parent is the, is the one that does the video for those purposes and cut them up and and then there's obviously a lot of people that just film it and then there's a lot of people that like a coach will send someone out every game like charlie's team one year had every parent one time video of the game so that he could have it it's like okay cool we just never did it because i wasn't going to a game with a, with a camera I wanted to watch my kid so i always paid someone else to do it um but uh but, but there's all kinds of reasons for video i'm not I, we're not judging that that's whatever you do whichever you want in your life we're just saying in the there's a certain time and a place where it's like totally inappropriate and actually to qualify that even when i was saying that on the last podcast i did say maybe there was a reason for him doing it 
maybe he was taking yeah, clips sending to it sending to it to a college okay. and stuff, which would be fine, mm-hmm. right? That would be fine. Uh, but in that setting, it wasn't the most appropriate. Thing. Well, and, but it's it's also just a good. You can use it as a tool for learning, which we've we've said we've advised people to do. Like, if you need to do something, watch video. Like, it's a great way to learn. Like, obviously, we understand the the benefits of the video. So it's like, it's just the 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 point is, as you said, there's a time and a place to do things. And normally, if you find a parent who couples taking video with yelling and screaming from the stands, that's normally a certain type of person because we've seen it time and time again, right? So we're more pointing out for education purposes. It's not like to bash parents or anything like that. It's just to, as, a, as a teaching moment, you know what I mean? So that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, Next part, or I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So if we're going, if you want to get it, oh, I don't know if you want to get into this, but if you want to get into more like the, from a hockey perspective, just from the, or even the teaching perspective, like when it's appropriate to use versus not, or did you have a different thing you wanted to touch on first? I was just going to say like, okay. Obviously, video is a great tool. Like, obviously, video is a great tool. In fact, I would say if you're trying to learn, if you're trying to study the game, I don't really know outside of watching a live game how you would do it. Yeah. No so, better way. <laughs> yeah, obviously, video is great. And um, the great thing about video is that it doesn't lie. You can't you can't lie. It is it is what it is. If you said that I dumped the puck in deep, but you didn't, it's it'll show there. Right now, there's excuses that you can make, or there's reasons that could happen, but the video doesn't lie. So it's a very honest, uh, good piece of feedback. It's a great, probably number one tool for teaching and learning. Period. Period. So it's it's good. So obviously, our our purpose is to help parents and coaches to use it properly if you can, or just for your enjoyment, whatever you want to do. And um, yeah, so there's different reasons why people do it memories and all that kind of stuff and sharing with but um but anyways we talked about that just for a second there so um i would say anyways you go to your question so but i want to go from i want to do the parents the coaches and the player perspective on it so let's maybe i don't know if you want to care which one you start from but if we go like let's say as a coach maybe if you are going to take if you're going to use video i want to talk about like where it's good where it's bad how to do it how to not do it so just a couple examples of certain things maybe you can touch on. I remember when I was a kid, my dad would take, because our coaches didn't do video at all. My dad would take video like once every, like once in a while, very infrequently, but once in a while he would do it. And it would just be like, just sit and watch it. And my dad didn't know a lot about like the systems of hockey, but when I was a little kid, we didn't really have systems anyways. So it's kind of like, Hey, like you're not engaged here. You're not engaged there, whatever. So from a coaching perspective, talk about maybe a little bit about that age group. And then I remember as I got older into uh, like college, junior college, it's like, okay, we have a video meeting now, right? And now the video meeting, some, sometimes it'd be, we're looking at D zone video and then this guy's getting carved for three minutes because he didn't get the puck out uh, versus using it actually just for teaching purposes. Um, so maybe you can talk about like that spectrum from like youth to higher level. And then as a coach, how you would use that as a tool with your team for each other. Because sometimes I, I see comments where it'll be like, I have a 10 U, uh, U10 team and I want to do some video with them versus I coach the ACHA team and I want to do video with them. So maybe talk about that yeah. kind of evolution. Yeah, no, that's a good way to, to do it because it's different because actually when I was thinking about it and just jotting d- down a couple notes, I put it in different ways. The, the way you ask the question is clearer. So um, when, w- when you're coaching youth, like, and there is no necessarily right or wrong way to do video, but what you want to do as a coach is understand that it's a great teaching tool, but just like school or a seminar or anything that you, you're you uh, watching, if it's not interesting, if, then you're getting nothing out of it. So I think the goal is, especially in youth hockey, because in youth hockey, it's not you're not the boss. Man. I'm just playing hockey for you. Once you get to the higher levels, it's like, no, you have to learn this. And if you don't pay attention to it, like, see you later, alligator, right? So it's very, there's a different, uh, um, there's a different um, tone to it, tone to, to teaching and there's a different audience that you're teaching to. So I, I find in youth hockey um, and I would say youth hockey, like until it gets very serious at the AAA level, that it's a great tool to, uh, to teach, but how I, how I did it, and this is not the only way, but it was very effective for me is I made it a fun day or a fun time of the week or every second week. So I didn't, we didn't have the technology to clip things and I didn't have the interest in doing that. 
but what I what I did with the video was like we I taught on the ice, taught in the game, did practice in games and all stuff. Then we would take uh, take the video for a game. One of the parents would always film, like because they just did that, and some rinks had them, so whatever. So one of the parents filmed all the time, and he gave us a clip. So instead of running through it, I would just start with the drop of the puck. I might start there. Like several times, I start with the drop of the puck, and because they were young, I made it very interactive. And I and and by the way, I don't know if that's a bad thing as you get older, because making it interactive your your players feel like they're part of it or oh I know the answer I'm smart or maybe a whole bunch of guys blurt it out and it becomes like okay I get it you know what I mean like interactive makes it a little bit more and then you yeah. know your audience is listening That's you're not engaging. yeah they're not yeah. trolling for yeah yeah exactly. right so uh or or instead of just saying do you understand that and they go yeah yeah you like, don't want it to be like a lecture right right That's, right yeah. right so what I would do is I would say okay boys we'd sit around there and the coaches be in there and they loved it too so we just press play and so just before it before the puck would drop, it's okay, stop it. Okay, so what do we do if we lose the draw? And someone would say, tie your guy up. This, this, this. So, yeah, good job, boys. So the puck would drop and the, be a simple, the puck would go to our D. And so let's say the D was starting to uh, carry it, you know, to the middle of the ice. I'd stop it. i said, okay, what, what, what is the position that we're supposed to be in for an outlet? What is the D supposed to do? So that, oh, there's supposed to be support and hinge and the center would be on a deep swing and all this, whatever, right? And I'd be like, okay, great. And I'd just go through maybe in game time, maybe 12 seconds of a game. And I would be able, and they were interacting with me and teaching. And it'd be great. And then maybe I'd go, and that would might take 15 minutes. When I did it this way, they just never wanted it to end. But I would end it, obviously. Yeah. Or else I'd still do it. <laughs> but, and then maybe I'll clip it to like you're in the offensive zone. And then it would be like, okay, oh, stop. Puck's dumped in. What do we do? And they would explain, okay, let's see if we could, if we did it. And they would be like, good job, boys, or whatever. Or if you'd see something, say, okay, uh, Charlie, uh, you're F2. What, are you F2 or F3 here? F2. Okay, so should you be going harder on the puck or on this lane or whatever, whatever? Yeah, I know. And then you might even say, okay, so what were you thinking? And then they can explain it. Maybe they're going to bullshit you, but... All those things. So for me, that was a really, really, really good way to do youth hockey. Right. So, okay. So wait, so that would be, what would you recommend on, let's say, just to put a line on it, at what age would that style be the way you would go? And then two, would it be like, okay, we do a quick, if there's something to correct, then it would be like, okay, we stop on it for, you know, a minute and just see like what he was thinking or what he should have done or whatever. And then we just keep it moving onto the next thing or are we like hammering that thing and it's like now we're doing this in practice like how how would you do that those teaching moments well i would i would more or less just like you would see what would happen in a game but if you see something reveal itself over and over then it'd be something to work on mm. right yeah so it's like a common yeah. thing right yeah so it was and like then, it wasn't harping on it because right. so that age would have been like once you once you're playing with matching socks and jerseys in, you're, you're traveling to like a small town or whatever because it's like they're and, and they they've expressed that they want to be good at hockey right and then i would use that tool right up until i, I you could use that with juniors like i mean you could do that at any level and just say what, what's going on here what should we be doing did we do it right that's a good way another thing that i did as uh once you get to like the bantam like so the u 14 ish and even 13 if you can clip it out because now you, they, they get hockey a little bit more. You could like focus on like certain themes more yeah. than like just yeah. the game. Yeah, you yeah. can do that. Then you start picking it out and you can start, and then you can also show other teams' tendencies if you have enough uh, video yeah, or, or that, yeah. uh, resources to do that. So that's where I would start clipping things out a little bit if, if that. But what I did with um, when I was coaching at uh, in the U.S., uh, one of the things we used to do before practice because we had a room is we just play the game while they were stretching. And every guy likes to watch himself play. So they'd be stretching on the big TV. And and, and then, you know, you're not, you, but it was great because it wasn't like uh, you weren't beating the shit out of them or giving them too much. Just be like, oh, Eric, watch this four check you just did here. This is unreal. And so he'd be like stretching. And go, oh, yeah. And the boys would be like, oh, good four check. And then, oh, hey, guys, you see this one here? See that? We talk about F3 all the time. So way too low or way too high or whatever. It's like 
just a casual way yeah, of doing right. video. That's interesting. That's interesting. So then once you got up to the that, like, let's say U14, U15, U16 in that area, then we're starting to go more towards not all the time necessarily, but it would be a little bit more specific to like a certain thing rather than just flow through the game or like the example you just said, you just throw it on. And I think this is where as like, as the coach, you have to be able to read your group, right? Like what do they respond to? Because not every group's going to be the same thing. Like if, you know, we've mentioned several times the last few episodes about kids are just quieter now. They don't, they're not very responsive. So maybe when you go to do video with your quiet team, it just is super frustrating because they're not interactive. Well, you might think that they're not listening at all. Exactly. Right. Whereas if you do it a little bit more casually, now it's not as much frustration for you and you're still kind of getting the same message across anyways. So I think it's important that you can read that game as a coach and, and have different strategies that might work based on different teams. Right. Because if you always go with the, we're going to put the video on, turn the lights off. I'm going to sit here and just dictate to the team maybe they check out because I remember doing that in junior too. It's like, it'd be video time. And it's like, dude, or actually it was more, more in college. It'd be like, this is our fifth video meeting this week. And like, I have class, like I'm trying to hurry up and get here. I need to get dressed. I'm on the ice on time. And you're trying to like yell at me because I had a turnover and it's just like, dude, it's enough, man. It's enough. Right. So I think that's the age appropriate thing is a little bit of a theme that you need to think about, but then you also have to be able to read your group a little and see like what actually is going to get them to respond from the coaching perspective. Yeah. Right? And I, th- I think like along those lines is like also be aware, like when, it, when, when you're playing ju- major junior or, or NHL college, uh, semi-pro and stuff, it's different. It's your job. So you got to eat shit and you, you got to sit there and videos an hour and a half. You take an hour and a half, but I think it's important as a coach, if you want people's attention is that you keep, you keep it uh, time sensitive uh, and keep it interesting. And I, I really, I really believe that keeping it interactive the best that you can is a, is a huge benefit. That's the best way, man. And I've seen, I've sat in a couple with a couple coaches asked when when I was doing their skills, oh, just come to the video, maybe you can pick some things out. And it's like, I found they were too young to go clippy when they showed just a clip of the power play or D zone, um, and it was just like a lot of negative too like a lot mostly negative which is easy to do right um so i like like so so two two pieces there is like number one being uh time sensitive number two being interactive number three is try to find like if there's a negative add a positive in it and i'm not saying you gave the puck at the blue line good job what i'm saying is 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 it doesn't sometimes it has to be especially as you get older but when when there's a we'll call it like the big errors or the big mistakes. It's like you can give them shit, but it, but also you can also do it a different way and stop and say, okay, you know better than that. Right. But what, what were you thinking or how, what was going through your mind and then let them, let them talk. And it's like, okay, so then give them a fixable solution. Right. Like, obviously if we're going to do this, make sure we, at this point of the game, this puck needs to go here. Like, you know that, and it's, you know, I know you're trying, like put something in there that builds them, like not just a beat down. Yeah. Side tangent kind of might get us off track a little bit, but I was just thinking about this today because I was talking to one of the dads this morning. Um, cause I have a young group of kids and on, on Monday we were doing, I have one of the days where we kind of do a talk about something. It could either be like something off ice related, whether it's training or nutrition, recovery, whatever. And so the the one group, they're like grade five to eight in that range. So it's like, like how much are they going to listen to this conversation? So this, as the coach, the solution is it's all in how I present the information, right? So if I have a, a group of grade fives to eights versus grade nines to twelves, how I present that information has to be different. So one thing that I'm, I've realized is that you have to be very aware of like terminology too when you're trying to explain things because some, sometimes they just don't know what words mean. Like yeah. you, you take for granted that they know. So when you're doing video or you're trying to explain a concept like forecheck, right? If you say forecheck to a grade five, they might kind of know what forecheck means, but this is a, a, a game that I always do with the kids is I'll put a word on the board and I'll be like, okay, who knows what this word means? And like everyone puts their hand up. And then I'll say, okay, who can explain to me what this word means? And then a couple of kids leave their hand up and then I ask them to explain it and they can't explain what the word means. 
So they don't actually know a lot of the things that you're saying when, when you get younger, the younger you get, the more that's true. So the example I was thinking of was I was talking about nutrition concepts and I asked them like, what is a healthy food? Like, you guys know what healthy means? And everyone's like, yeah, I know what healthy means. Because of course, everybody knows what healthy means. And then I go, okay, explain to me what healthy means. And nobody knows how to explain the word, right? So when you're trying to, in terms of one, making things interactive, the question asking is what will get kids engaged, right? Number one. Number two, starting from like base level before you start to work up in the concepts, make sure that everybody has the base ideas down. So do they know what forecheck and backcheck means if they're younger, right? If you say like certain systems that, and maybe you have a name for your system, right? Because a lot of teams do that. When, maybe when you're a little bit older, you're 14, 15, 16. We're running X system. It's like, okay, do, does the kid know what X system is? Do they know what they're supposed to be running? Because now if you, if you start correcting before they even know what you're saying, or you start teaching before they even know what you're saying, they're, they're lost already, right? So making sure we're on the same plane to start, whether it's video, whether you're any kind of teaching you're doing, and then building up from there to make sure they're with you for the ride, that's really, really important. One, for getting them to be, being able to teach them, but two, that engagement factor, because using questions through the whole way, like you were talking about, even with video with your team, it's like, okay, hey boys, what are we supposed to do? That's a question. How are we supposed to forecheck? That's a question. And getting them to talk, that's how you do it. But you have to make sure they understand where you're coming from first before you start asking questions. Otherwise, kids are just like deer in the headlights, don't know what you're saying. You know what I mean? Real, real funny, as you said that, I remember in baseball, so we were playing in a tournament in Barrie, Ontario. And uh, coach, I'm 10, 11, 12. Coach gave me the signal. That's take a pitch. Take it. Take a pitch. I never knew what it meant. To me, take a pitch means, okay, take it. So came in, cracked it. Probably I, I, I went out. It either flew out or whatever. Whatever. The, 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 the thing that was supposed to happen didn't happen. And Coach, Coach Bob comes up to me. He's about this tall, eh? about four feet tall. <laughs> Looked like his face was a chewed caramel. <laughs> Had the French accent, little, and he had carried a little poodle. <laughs> he thought he was Joe Baseball, eh? Chewed caramel. Oh yeah, that's a new one. Anyhow, he uh, <laughs> he 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 told me that I didn't uh, take a pitch. I said, "We, I did. I hit it." He goes, "So I explained taking a pitch was taking it, let it go, no, under any circumstances." I said, "Oh, now the next time you say take a pitch, I'll, I'll know." But you know, use terms in hockey. Like I know it was later. When the term tracking first came out, I didn't know what it was. I was an experienced hockey player. Tracking. That was a term because I was out of the game for a little bit. Tracking. That just means back checking. I don't know why we have to say back tracking is better than back checking now, but that's the term that's being used is tracking. Right? And, you know, another little thing, if you tell a kid, be, you know, you need to be heavier on a puck right now. What is that? Heavier on the puck. Like those are those are terms that people don't understand. So yeah, it's important that they understand your terminology. Yeah, you can take for granted that they just get it, right? When, yeah. when maybe they don't. Yeah. So. You know, I use like talking to kids all the time. I, like, I talk about offensive zone getting into space. I'm like, get in the honey hole, get in the honey hole. Right. And I, I always just assume you know what the honey hole is. Yeah. And 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 maybe they kind of know what it is. Well, you can guess. Right? Maybe, but maybe it's like, okay, I need to be by the hash marks in front of the net. It's like, no, it's it could not be exact, anything, right? man. So it's like they, you, you need to make sure that it, it's yeah. clear, which is I think yeah. an important. You got an eleven year old kid that. This is the first time they heard it, and they go, "Honey, well, okay, coach, that's what kids do, right?" right. Hey, coach. Yeah. So and they funny. go walk away. Like, honey yeah. hole. <laughs> Where's yeah. the honey hole? I know. I know. Right? It's so funny. And then, obviously, for a coach, it gives you a really like if you can do some individual video coaching, a couple minutes here and there, a clip here yeah, and true. there. Yeah. It's a huge, huge, gigantic tool to uh, to teach a kid, and it's good that you can pull something aside from that kid. Um, and then you can ask the questions, right? You can have a one-on-one -on -one time and you can just say, okay, so, um, you can make it really positive. You can beat someone down with it, whatever way you want to go, but you can actually find out what's in their head as well. It's like, okay, what were your, what were your thought pattern there? Um, when, maybe, would you, when would you start that? Like what age? The one-on-one? -on -one? Uh, I think it's not necessarily age. I think it's more engagement. Mm. Like if you see kids that are really serious, I mean, probably not doing it at three, yeah. but <laughs> <laughs> but I would say probably maybe 12, 13, 13. When they're old enough to kind of yeah, yeah, be a yeah, little yeah, more serious. Yeah. 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 I yeah. mean, I, I don't think it's ever, I think that's probably the appropriate age. I mean, there's no probably definitive answer. Yeah. You just you know? got to re read it a little read, bit. Read the read room the a little bit. Yeah. yeah.
I got but you. like having the one on one coaching a little bit, just a clip or two, just to say, you know, you're doing a good gives you a chance to just talk to him a little bit. So that he cares about me again. Took the time, all that kind of stuff. So and then it, it, it's n- always nice to find out a kid's thought process, right? Because like if you're showing like, let's say when you're get, getting to the ages where you're where there's body contact, and and you know that the kid is tentative to go in corners, let's say, right? But you're showing a couple clips, and and you know instead of saying like you're a chicken shit, or you need to have more balls, saying it that way, you can just say okay, so like you're holding up a little bit. Is there like concerns like you can just talk to him like a human like get it out of him right because no one wants to sit there and say i'm scared of getting hit but you know you could open up that door and say i can help you with this or whatever right you know what i mean is so then maybe last question before we go to parents what uh would there ever be a time or or what do you think about not or never using video let's say youth levels obviously junior college you're going to be using video but from like high level triple a to lower is it something that as a coach it's like you should be taking some time to use video for certain I, things? I, I or think, what do you if think you're about playing that? triple a, like if you're playing travel, like when you get to the point where kids want to win games and stuff like that, I think it's important that you should use, I'm not saying video every day. I think you should have five minutes of video here and there. I think you should have it because it's important. Uh, if, unless you have nothing to say, like if that's not your thing, you don't know how to do it. Then I guess don't, don't pretend. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Don't pretend maybe. Um, but, but I would say if, um, if you if you can teach anything and and I think it's important that the kids see themselves play or um, see what you want because when you, it's like you could think you're a good hockey player right now I'll, I'll talk about this in the individual thing but you could think that you had a great game then you watch video you go oh man I wasn't that good or I was I thought I was better than that or I thought I worked harder than that it doesn't look like it so video doesn't lie so it's always it's an important thing to for kids to see themselves. Last thing I would say is vi- there's there's different types of video as well. And it's like you can send uh, as a coach, I'm just saying as a coach, uh, if you want to get your kids prepared a little bit. I'm not the biggest fan of this, but people do it. And I'm like, I don't have a problem with it. Some guys send uh, video or uh, emails of what the practice plan is going to look like. So like some kids will get into it. Some won't. Some, like, a lot of kids are visual learners anyways. So if you can see a, a video of it, a clip, 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 and then you have an idea of what you're doing. It's not to you know, beat someone up for not understanding the drill when you start, but at least they have an idea, right? So anyways, that's that for me. Okay, if we go, let's go to parents now. So if uh, I'm mom or dad, because <clears throat> lots of people do this. So I'm going to put aside like you're taking video for the memories or to send to someone or like you need to take clips to send to college or your advisors or whatever. So all that is fine. So I'm putting that aside. Strictly from like the hockey improvement standpoint, if I'm mom or dad and I'm going to take videos for the purposes of it being corrective, how would you recommend one goes about doing that? Um, And maybe some of like the pros, cons, good ways, bad ways that from the parent perspective and we'll try to keep it separate from the players because we want to do the players separately afterwards. So what do you think from the parent side? I think it gets very dicey when parents do it. Mm. Okay. This is just like, again, I want to be very clear on this. This is not to beat parents up for doing it because maybe your intentions are really, really good. And even if they are, yeah, even if they, even if they are like, so I'll give you a very good example. I think it just gets dicey. So and here's the other thing. Most I know AAA teams either have a designated person to take video. Some coaches don't want that shared with the team. I don't know why. Um, a lot of them will be put on YouTube, a lot of the games. So there's usually an opportunity to watch it. And then if you want to video the game, fine. That's fine. Like, whatever. So, But I really believe that it gets very, very dicey when parents want to go over games with their kids. So I would consider myself very qualified to do it with my kid. Very. I could break the game down what they're doing, he's doing, inside out. But I know for a fact my son did not want to sit there at home and go through the game and his good and his bad. On my dime, like on my time. It would have not gone well if if I said, okay, Chooch, let's uh, six thirty after dinner. We're gonna watch watch your game against London. 
like when he was in youth hockey. There would have been a ton of resistance with that, and for good reason. And I had something to offer. So I couldn't imagine, just very sincere here, I couldn't imagine what it would be like for a kid who is at whatever age to have to go through the game with their dad that maybe played at a high level. I don't care. Or didn't play at all or anything in between. Because number one is, I don't even know if, do you know if your kid even wants to watch the game? Might not even care. Um, and I th- I just think it's one of those moments. It's like your intentions could be very good, but that goes back to my, who's the motivated person in this relationship? Mm, is it yes. the player or is it the parent? That's the number one question. I know for me, he, so my kid knew where to find the games. Like not every game. There were some games that were on YouTube. It was typically against, uh, Elgin Middlesex, a uh, couple of teams and he would put them on YouTube and I'd be there. Like I'd walk in and like, Oh, can I watch it with you? Yeah. So we'd watch. And what do you, what do you think a, a 14, 13, 12 year old kid wants to see when they watch it? His goals. Wants his to see points. his goals yeah. or, or quietly wants to see how good he is. Yeah. That's what they want to see. So if, which I didn't do, <laughs> if he made a mistake or didn't do something that was good, I didn't have to say a thing. He would. Or he would say nothing. Because it would be like, Ugh. right? Oh, I don't like that. Or he would make an excuse in front of me. And I would just say, oh, whatever, it's a long game. Or what would you do different if you had to do it again? Or I'd ask him a question and he would kind of tell me. What were you, or I would say, oh, what was going through your head there? Did you see something else? But I wasn't sitting there coaching him. I just enjoy watching the game or I wouldn't really watch because 12 years old. <laughs> but he would be like, hey, dad, check out this goal. Check out this hit. Check out this. Oh, look at this toe drag I did. Like, stuff like that. That's all they want to see. Right. I don't believe there's too many kids that want to sit there eating a bowl of chips or kale salad or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Going over the game with dad. I don't believe that. Right. I don't. I don't. I, I think it's so few and far between. Okay. So, so two two questions. So, one. If you're a dad, for example, where it's like, okay, I really think I have something to offer, number one. Number two, I have, I think I have a really good relationship with my kid where we can do this the proper way, number two. Um, I guess I'll answer my own question. That So that situation, I think there might be something there where it's like, okay, like you guys have a really good setup where that's something that's good for you guys and that could work, like fine. But I find that, even as someone who knows and has something to offer, like you, for example, it's like, what if you're like saying something different than the coach? That's what right? I got in my it's notes. Like, yeah, it's like, what if, what if you, the next piece of advice you give is exactly opposite to what the coach was asking? Because you wouldn't know, even dude, if you know hockey. Dude, right? I, told, I said this on a podcast before I said it to you. There's a game last year. Last year, my son's playing the OHL. Well, I wasn't able to go to the game. My wife was there. My brother was there. Um, and, my kid was having. I like, remember. Yeah, I remember. He was having yeah. a good, just playing good, steady, physical, like you know, just like that's the player that he's supposed to be. And 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 on this game, I was watching, and he was playing very good, but he was not physical as he usually is. So my brother texts me and texts like this. My brother texts me. He goes, "Charlie uh, injured or something?" I said, "I don't know. It's uh, he was. He did say he's nagging this, but I said I don't, he didn't say much about it." My wife goes, he's not hitting as hard and as much as often as he typically does. So I'm like, you know, and so I, I'm sitting here as a dad, you know, uh, three hours away going, you know, son. Yeah. No, that's what I was saying. It's like, you know, you, 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 you just, do you want to f- this up on purpose? Yeah, right. Like, you know what you got to do. You've got four things that you need to do in a game. Why aren't you doing it? Like I'm saying it to myself and yeah. to you, I'm like, I had a bit of uh I remember the game. Yeah, I, I was like sitting there, you know, like, do you want to take yourself down a notch and take move your get to the fourth line? Is that what you're trying to do? But he was on the ice a lot. So I'm like, whatever. But and then he played a great game. He ended up scoring and blah, blah, blah. And then uh because you know, my wife goes, How do you think he played? I said, I thought he played well, but just not not as physical as as typical. So he comes out after the game, sees mom. Hot, smart, biggest smile ever. 
And she's like, oh, good game. He goes, yeah. He goes, I'm just, I'm so happy. He goes, you know, coach is so happy with me because we had a job to shut a team down. They said, don't take it easy on people. We don't want you out of play, out of the play. So that's to your point. Parents are watching a different game than what the coach might be asking from them. So if I would have came out there and had sourpuss face, I wasn't there, so I couldn't. But if I if I'm sitting there going, as as a like I guess a, a lot of parents would, you you didn't hit. That's why I don't coach my kid. You you weren't hitting. You weren't physical. Yeah, you played fine, but it's not the engagement that you, you typically have to get yourself. Yeah, you need to do you be, want to be a pro, Charlie. Yeah. Do you want to be a pro, but you didn't do pro shit. Yeah. And then oh. Well, my coach said, don't. Oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Who's exactly. the idiot? So, so that's exactly, yeah. exactly my point. So even if you know the game, even if yeah. you can help, yeah. right? So even if you have that, because that's what a lot of people say is like, yeah, my kid wants to do it or whatever. And like, so, so that's another one too. Like my kid asks me to do it, right? So it's like, okay, first of all, is the kid actually asking? Or are you doing that weird thing where you like make the kid feel like they have to do it? And like, so they ask you because if they don't ask you, then you're going to be like, oh, don't you want to do video? Like this kind of thing. So first of all, is it that situation or is the kid asking you to do video? And then if the kid is asking you to do video, you have to make sure you approach that with a lot of humility. Because if you said, well, pucks here, you should be going here. It's like, maybe you're right, but maybe you're also not right. If the coach is saying something different, right? Obviously there's a lot more leeway, the younger the kids are where advice can be not as harmful, but exactly to your point, if you come in you know guns blazing and you're just like you didn't do this you didn't do this you didn't do this it's like yeah but my coach said this other thing or or we play this system and like your kid might not even be able to articulate it right it's like in your d zone son you have to go engage that guy and then you know the coach said well yeah but the wingers are supposed to go low and not the defensemen for, or whatever right and it's like oh maybe the kid doesn't even say that and he's just like thinking well i thought i was supposed to be in front of the net now my dad's gonna have to go to the corner it's like, and maybe he can't even comprehend like how to communicate that message to dad who's he trying to teach him on video, right? Or mom. So I think that's important. Even if you know, even if the kid's asking, it's like you just have to be careful about the advice you give because you don't know if it's good or bad, particularly if you haven't played hockey or you don't know then the, how the, the game works. Because I can't tell you how many times, how many conversations I have with parents where they're telling me what they told their kid. And I'm just like, that's, that's not correct. Right. So, and it's unfortunate because the kids are, they're, they're helpless, right? They're, you, there's nothing that they can do to get out of that situation. Well, the, right? the, the other thing I would, I would say would be like all the, all the teams that my sons have played for, most parents didn't play or they played, but they didn't play at the level that their kids are at. Being, being honest and there's several coaches like we've had my son had several coaches who their kids have their the coaches have never played at the level that they're coaching so anyways so if 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 you're gonna teach something you probably should actually understand it and so i i, I and the parent the kids aren't stupid if you if you're sitting there going over video with your kid and you played on the green jersey team, and you guys didn't even have matching socks. And he saw pictures of you playing hockey, and your knob was the size of my head on your stick, and it was four inches too tall. Like it was very obvious that you weren't a very good hockey player. Or if you ever skated with your kid, and the kid looks at you like, oh, okay, that wasn't very good, <laughs> then he's probably not listening to what you have to say, you know? And it's just like, I think the thing is when, when kids do that, like anytime my kid would throw on, his hockey games, he would either say, Hey dad, check this out. Or if I, if I happen to be in the same room watching it with him, what he, what he loved to hear was that was a good job. That was nice. They didn't, they're not there for a beat down. They're not there for that. That's, that's my thing. And then the last thing I would say, honestly, is a lot of parents will judge. And I was probably guilty of this too. Like I'm not saying in the video aspect, but I'm guilty. I would be guilty of this. We have a perspective of what we want from our kids meaning dedicated, right? So a lot of parents would say, did you shoot your pucks today? And the kid would be like, yes or no. Okay. How many? Well, you need to shoot 500 a day. Some parents don't have an idea how long it takes or what 500 pucks is. To shoot. What's that like? Right? So you're pushing it on them, pushing on them, pushing on them. Because they didn't shoot, there's some kids that, 
another example would be when Charlie started working out. Okay. He, we had the gym. It was especially in COVID. That's when he really started. When COVID started, we'd come to this gym. He worked out with dad because there's really no one else to work out with. So he was getting into it, but it was like a little reluctant, but like he liked it. But then Zach Cassian called me and said, can I come in? Yes. So Zach started coming in and Charlie worked out with Zach and then he fell in love with him. But I couldn't yell at him for being a 13 or 14, no, 14 year old kid. Can't be upset with him because he's not totally dedicated to being a hockey player. Do you know what I mean? Like, here's your advantage. Like, think about this. This is a conversation I could have had with him. Well, this is a conversation I did have with him because it was, I'm trying to make the best of a, of a bad situation. COVID, no one's allowed to go anywhere. So I have a gym. My son's coming to the gym. I'm going to keep him saying and me saying, take advantage of life. So, hey, Charlie, for the, we thought it was only going to be a month or two months of, of, of no activity. So I said, hey, Charlie, in these next two months, let's get to the gym. You can be, get in better shape. I was just doing a positive spin that it was healthy. Get in the gym. We'll get you a little stronger. We'll get you ready. When you're ready to play again, you'll be in really good shape. Okay, Dad, that'd be great. So it was it was fine the first few times. And then after a week or two, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he would do it do it well and all that stuff. But it's a dad it's a dad thing, man. It was it was the best thing for him. And then when Zach came in, it was all of a sudden I got to work with an NHL hockey player. And then the light went off. So I can't get upset with him for not for being fourteen. And not being totally dedicated to hockey. He said he was. He thought he was. He loved it. But he didn't eat, sleep, everything hockey the way my perspective, what I, my knowledge is of what it would actually take. So a lot of times, like, if your kid doesn't want to go over video with you, dad, or do all these other things, it's not because they're not into it. It's maybe they're not mature enough. Maybe it's not that the time isn't right. Maybe you're an idiot. Maybe you're not the person for them. Like it will, it will happen when it needs to happen. And then the last thing I would say on that is once your kid, like it, you said it earlier in the podcast, once you get to college or junior, it's like every day you got video. So there'll be a day where he, your son, if he gets to a certain level, where he's going to be watching video basically every day and he'll get his share. You know, it's, it's, it's good. Like, so video is very helpful. If the kids do it on their terms, it's even more helpful as a coach. If they are presented to it the right way, it's helpful when it's shoved down their throat, like, especially from a parent's side, I don't think it's helpful at all. Yeah. I think it's negative. I agree. And you know, and I'll, just to be clear too, like when we're talking about if you've played or not and all that, that doesn't mean you have nothing to offer if you haven't played because there's people that have played that do a horrible job also, but it's like, it's just being aware of your own limitations. That's the, that's the key. Like there's a reason why at engineering school, only engineers teach engineering. Like there's a reason for that. Right. So that's, it, there's a little, there's something to that. Right. So just make, it's not, it doesn't mean you can never give advice or you can never try to be helpful or whatever, but it's just about the awareness. Right. Obviously as the parent, you, you need to guide them and you need to help them to a degree. But when it comes to like very specific things, you need to know where your limits are as mom and dad, because your kids don't think you have any limits. Like you think your parents are superheroes, man. You think they know the answer to everything. So it's important that you don't kind of abuse that power that you have in that situation. So uh, maybe we can finish up talking about from the player side, maybe using video effectively or not. Um, and maybe we could do the same kind of age age thing too. Maybe starting when you're a little bit younger, if you're going to do video versus older. Yeah, I, I think I think it's really simple. I think the number one rule is, is that if you watch video, it's good. That's very good. It's a very good tool. If you watch video of yourself, that's good. If you watch video or you watch hockey just to learn about hockey. I think there's 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 nothing but benefits to that. Um, at a certain age, like I, I, I'm not going to put an age limit on when you should start because like I said, if you, there, there'd, be a, there'd be a point where coaches start throwing it at you and there'd be a point where it just becomes an everyday thing if you have the talent or the, the will to get to higher levels. So I don't think it's critical that you watch video. I would say this though, if you watch it, like if you are studying the game a little bit, or if you want to find flaws in your game, or if you want to learn about the game or your game, or, you know, what, you know what I'm saying is that if you watch video, you can learn a lot of things about yourself and your tendencies. And especially if you're being real with yourself. And I don't know if it's hard to, I don't know if you could watch it without being honest with yourself. Like 
like deep down, like when you're watching a game and you know because you have the <clears throat> you have the emotions to go with it. Like you know when the the time when maybe you went into a corner a little bit scared, you know what that felt like. So when that you see that on video, it's like you're gonna see it and feel the emotions at the same time. So it's like um, it's good for you to see that. It's good to you, like, or you think that you're working really, really hard. And the coach maybe said, it's like, you're not moving your feet. It's like, yes, I am. But then you watch the video and go, oh, I'm not. It's like, okay. So if you can watch that and you can be honest with yourself, even if you're not, it's good for you. But if you can be honest with yourself and say, yeah, okay, I'm not moving my feet. You, you will see it. So I think it's really, really, really good to watch video of yourself. Uh, if you don't, or if you skip a day or whatever, I don't think it's the end of the world. But if you're trying to learn the game, and it's particularly your game, I think watching video is very, very important. And if you don't, as I said earlier, if you're a good enough hockey player, at some point, you're going to get video thrown down your face. So I, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say there's a point where you need to. Yeah. So if we fo- maybe focus on kids that are going to, and they want to watch video. Do you have a, maybe like a prescription on on how to do it? Like how, one would be like how much to do it, to if there is even an amount. Two would be types of things you're looking for, or how to have some purpose with the video, like how to not because one thing you could do is just you put the game on and watch the game and look for your good shit, right? That's what I would do when I was a little kid. To be like like to your point, all I want to see is my goals. I want to see my toe drag. I don't want to see that I didn't back check hard. I don't want to see that, right? So maybe what's the prescription how much when those kinds of things and then um how to have like some purpose when you're doing it on your own yeah um, I, I, again i wouldn't make it i wouldn't make it like um um an exercising driving to nuts but i would I, w- I would say like maybe you break down a shift right like look for what you do well number one that would that would be like probably my number one thing is look for at what you do well Find things that make you go, okay, that was that was a good that's a good player because so do, you, sorry, do you mean like in general things that make you do well or like trying to find those three, four things about you that are good or both? Well that if you find what you do well, you're gonna probably find the three, four things. Ah, yes. Right? Yeah, good point. So yeah. if you if you if you carry the puck through the notch zone really, really well, that's one. Mm-hmm. There's a that's a good thing. Where you're like consistently doing that. It's like right. yeah, I see. If you finish hits or you stop at the net, there's three. Yeah, knocking you're, pucks away or something. Yeah, like that yeah, 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 yeah. If you if you have, you know, so find find a few things that you go, okay, I like that. Okay, if I do that, right? Because what happens is, you see that you're good, you're good at getting to the net, right? And you do that consistently. It's like, okay, maybe that makes you do it even harder, which is makes it even better, right? And then on on the other side, if you realize that defensively. If you watch the game honestly, you see the things that you don't like. So maybe you don't finish hits. It's like I, I I don't really hit anybody, or I slow my feet down, or I give the puck away when there's pressure. It's like okay, well maybe I can work on that. Maybe or and then you may, then then you can take a deeper dive into your video and say okay, so now let's go back to the good. Say okay, so I'm I'm really good in the neutral zone carrying puck. I'm getting a shot on net, but I'm just throwing it out there, but it's like from the top of the circles, it's not really the best shot. So how can I make this better? Am I forcing the shot or what if, now you can maybe look at the game a little bit deeper and say, okay, so maybe if I went to the middle more, or maybe I went to the outside more, or maybe if I went to my, if I held up or slowed down or sped up or whatever, that would create space because this guy's here that system works better. we're back to that like asking yeah, questions yeah thing, yeah. Right? yeah yeah so then that, that's that's kind of how you learn and you can try things and so you play the game you do your practice you watch a video and you see you, you so when you play you think you you think you're one thing when you watch yourself play then you might have a different opinion of yourself it might be better it might be worse right so there might be a game where you thought you're a horseshit but you actually watch a video and go, no actually that was pretty good right. right and then you can take the thing you could take those things and put them together and, and put it in your practice, right? So maybe you bobble pucks. So maybe it's like, oh, man, I got to need a stick handle more. Just notice I bobble pucks a little bit. Let me put some, like, little things like that. So I think it's very effective for kids, but only if you want it. Right. Only if you want it. Right. So. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I think that's that's a pretty good uh, overview 
for all these things. Is there anything else you want to finish up on for the, for the video stuff? Or no, I I was gonna throw in a couple of things, but I know we're running out of time and stuff. But I was just it was we, got, we got a couple you, minutes if you want. I was to. gonna ask you what's your general thoughts since we talked about video. What general thoughts on just technology in general? Oh, this is cool. Actually, we got a I got a question from a, a guy on on this that I want to I need to forward to you still. Actually, it was about have you heard of this Helios thing? Have you heard of it? I've only heard of it. I don't really know how it works, but that's kind of the technology type stuff, video type stuff. Um, it's good. It's a tool. It's a tool. You know, I, I was talking to the kids on Monday about uh, food and I was saying, I'm not saying there's no, no such thing as a bad food or a good food, but instead of thinking of it like that, think of it as like, this is a tool that I can use. And I would say the same thing about technology. Like there's video can be good. It can be not good. You know, using these tracking device, like the whoop strap can be good. If it, if it drives you nuts, then it could not be good. Right. If you're going to pretend to use the technology, it's not worth the money. If, if you're going to use it and actually get something out of it, then maybe it's worth it. You know? So I think all of these, all these little pieces that are starting to become more and more involved in the game, it's like, you can, you can use all of them and they're all good. But I think there's a point where you can just technology it to death and there's, you just need to go play to a, to a degree. Right. And and there's a lot that you can learn by just doing as opposed to uh, analyzing. So I, th I think a lot of times, maybe not a lot of times, but I think people can get a lost in the technology where they're just so caught up on like numbers and analysis and all of that, that they start to forget the other half of it is like doing the stuff, you know? So it can be good for that. It can help tailor your training. It can help show you like metrics you need to improve on. But there's certain things that, like technology just can't get at and like you need to do it do it in, in real life on your own or you know even in things that like uh like mental exercises like visualization and all those kinds of physical things that you're actually going to do um with your time i think that's a key point that can't be lost so i like it i like the technology in general i think it's good but i think it's important that it's not just technology all the time i think you can kind of technology it to death I don't know if that's what you would also say or not. Yeah, no, I was just interested because I'm thinking, okay, there's video and then there's so many other things right now. Like, so for me, I love the whoop strap. I love it. And it's not because I use the technology like crazy, but like number one, um, working out without it now, I, I just like to know where my heart beats at, where my strain is at, where my calories burned are. Cause it's not like it's going to be 100% accurate, but it's fairly closer. It gives me an indication. So I like that. It keeps me honest every day. And again, when I, when I look at the data, cause there's, I mean, obviously there's some days like when I went out with my friends the night before and I don't do anything the next day because I'm hung over or just don't feel like it. I don't really have to look at the strap or the, the phone to tell me where I'm at in the day, but I do like looking at it and saying, wow, you didn't do diddly shit today, did you? Right. I like, uh, I like a lot of the technology in hockey, like just like even for working out, like the force plates. And I mean, in the gym, you could get really, really technical. I mean, I, I need to be the Montreal Canadiens to be able to afford that kind of stuff. In it, but I would like to have more uh, because it's like incredible to get good, good feedback from you. Uh, from the hockey standpoint, I really do like uh, how they've broken down like Instat or uh, Sport Logic and stuff oh, like that. Instat's crazy, man. Like you can just Can't watch your it. own shifts or anybody in the league if you have access to it and stuff, and you can just watch everything. Like you can break down your faceoffs, uh, your hits, anything that you want, and it's a, it's a really cool tool that I think is phenomenal. So like I was watching this uh, from a scouting perspective. You know, when a lot of people say, you know, how do how do they pick? How do they pick? Here's one. A lot of people are like. There's the one guy from Montreal that got drafted fifth overall, I guess it was. And then there was uh, Easton Cowan. And people are like, how is he a first rounder? And it's like, well, I'll tell you how. He's a freaking animal. Like he's all over pucks and he works his ass off and he's very skilled. But who who gives a shit what I say? So, and I've even wondered it at being in the industry is like, how can you, like, honestly, how do you come up with like, this is first, this is 30th, this is 74th. Like it's incredible. But when you look at what an instat does, and the amount of scouting, like, so if I, if I was to break down my, if I'm a scout and I was to break down, these are the players I like. Now you, you as a team can spend Eric Palazzolo. I want to watch every clip from every game, every specific thing that I want to see. I, as a staff, we can watch hours and hours and hours and hours just on video, plus the games that we saw, plus, plus, plus. 
So if you don't think that they've done their homework on a player, you're 100% wrong. They've seen hours and hours and hours of just you. So that's what I think is incredible about how some of it's evolved. So if you ever think as a as a fan or as a player that they got you wrong, they might. I mean, there's still mistakes and there's still, you know, but, but they have a really good idea what type of player you are. Like really good. Yeah. <clears throat> I think the, from the more like maybe more philosophical perspective, it's really awesome when you can have something that's subjective and something that's objective at the same time. And I think that's what the technology does. So it's like, for example, the whoop strap. It's like, if I wake up and I feel like shit, but then I look at my whoop strap and my recovery is 95%, I'm like, oh, okay, maybe I don't feel as bad as I think I feel. Or maybe once, maybe I just got to get moving and I'll shake off the, the rust from my sleep. Or maybe I woke up in the middle of a sleep cycle and that's why I feel shitty and not because I actually feel shitty, right? And then on the, from the hockey perspective, it's like, it's the same thing. It's like, you can do, you can go meet the kid. You can go watch the kid. You can go talk to the kid. And it's like, eh, I don't really like this kid. And then you look at all their instat stuff and it's like, man, he literally hits every single thing we need. Right. It's like, well, maybe I'll give the kid another chance. It's like, the, so these are the things where it's like, it's very nice to be able to pair stuff like that. Whereas in the past, everything was based more or less subjective. It's like, you go watch, you go watch a player. You didn't have access to all these stats. Yeah. You didn't have access to any of this stuff. Right. So a lot more guys would slip through the cracks or I've never seen the movie, but that Moneyball movie with the stats on all the baseball guys, it's like, that's, a, that is real life. Like that actually happens. Right. So it's nice to have both sides of it because then you can say, okay, this kid hits every metric. This kid also hits every metric. So now what's my separator? Now I can go to my subjective. It's like, I don't like this kid. I like this kid or whatever. Right. But you know that at least on paper, you have your bases covered of what you were asking for as a team, you know? So, and then from the individual perspective, it's the same thing. Like you have stuff like the loop strap, you have stuff like these, I don't know what this Helios thing does necessarily. I know it tracks some like met speed metrics and that kind of stuff, but, um, it's just their tools, their tools that are good. It's good to have something objective to look at. That's not just what you think. It's good to be able to pinpoint things you need to work on. But I, having said that, the one thing I will say is the younger you are, the more I don't think it's worth it because you just need to work on everything. It's like until you're hyper specializing, I don't think you necessarily need that really dialed in 100% pin. Because even like, even with the technology we have in here, like the force plate type stuff would be awesome to have. The bar, the speed bar thing that you can have to see how fast you're moving the bar. Those kinds of things are awesome. But it's like, at the end of the day, it's like I have 16 to 22 year olds. They all need to work on everything. It's like once they're 19, 20, 21, 22 and beyond. Now that stuff kind of makes more sense because we're looking for very specific gains in very specific areas. But when you're younger, I don't feel like it, unless if you have the resource, if you have the money, if you don't care about that stuff, then go for it. It's fine. But it's not necessarily as meaningful as for someone who's a little bit older or whatever even though they, they can still be good, good tools. So that's my, yeah. that's my brain vomit on that. Yeah, I think. I like it. I like it. Uh, um, anything else? Oh, good. Done. Okay. Hope you guys like that. Uh, memberships, if you want them, they're there. That's what's going to drive this ship for us. So um, head to the website or links in our bio and you, can, you guys can check that out. So hopefully you found this episode somewhat interesting because I like doing it. So that was good. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Goodbye.